All right, good afternoon, everyone. If you'd like to learn about Ukraine fatigue and what we can do to combat it, please come over here to the, the main stage where we've got a fabulous panel assembled. My name is Nina Yankovich. I am the vice president of the Center for Information Resilience, which is a uh, social enterprise nonprofit based in the United Kingdom that counters disinformation, documents human rights abuses, and combats online harms against women and minorities. Uh, and I've got a fabulous panel here for you today. So if we can get your attention after lunch, which might be a, a, a difficult uh, task, I would love to, to gather you all here. Um, I'm going to start off moderator's prerogative and, uh, and tell you a little bit about some work that we did at the Center for Information Resilience. <laughs> um, Yes, so we did a report earlier this year about Ukraine fatigue um, and something that we thought was uh, quite a, a concerning topic that had received too little attention uh, as the war got to the one-year mark. Um, polling that we did in late 2022 showed that in Bulgaria, for instance, 43% of people and in Slovakia, 39% of people uh, believed that their governments were doing too much for Ukraine. Similarly, in the United States in early 2023, the Pew Research Center found that a full quarter of Americans believed that the U.S. was giving too much support to Ukraine. And just a few weeks after that poll came out, a congressman, Matt Gates, uh, launched his Ukraine fatigue resolution, which wanted to stop all aid from Ukraine and alleged that the current aid had been mismanaged, which we all know, of course, is Russian disinformation. Now, throughout the conflict, we saw a lot of allegations that the images of suffering inflicted on Ukraine by Russia were fake. Uh, even at the beginning of this year, while my colleague Tom Southern and I, who you heard from earlier uh, this morning, when we were doing this research, we, we saw a lot trending on social media claiming uh, that there were no images of the war, of Ukraine, war in Ukraine, that they were all fabricated, which of course is ridiculous, particularly for our organization, which does geolocation, chronolocation of footage on social media coming out of Ukraine. In addition to all of that, we saw narratives uh, coming from Russia, of course, saying that not only was the aid being misused, but that NATO, quote unquote, provoked Russia into invading Ukraine, that refugees coming into Europe, into Poland and other countries were part of a, quote unquote, social tourism scheme. And yet, at that point, fatigue about the conflict hadn't been as successful as in other recent conflicts. And we posited that this was because of a couple reasons. One was the successful communication by the Zelensky administration. Uh, obviously very nimble, very creative communication that spoke to the suffering of the Ukrainian people, that spoke to uh, people's worries about the war and was documenting it in almost real time. The second thing was the images of the war on social media. We were seeing that suffering happening in real time. And I think for a lot of people, it was very, very difficult to look away. And then the third reason is also a little bit uncomfortable, but I think Europeans and Americans feel a little bit more affinity and proximity to Ukrainians, both culturally and geographically, because Ukraine is a mostly white Christian nation. And so these images, I think, people found more heart-rendering than images of conflicts that were far away uh, with people that they couldn't necessarily identify with. But that was then. What we're seeing now, a full 18 months after the full-scale invasion, is that audiences are really coming inured to these images. Ukraine is falling out of the headlines, and people are becoming more and more frustrated as we head into another winter of the effects of the war on grain and fuel prices and more frustrated at government spending. And so what my colleagues and I posited in this report were communications pieces of advice for governments, for civil society organizations. And the two big conclusions that we drew were, one, we can't brush aside the public's concerns, right? These people aren't necessarily dumb, but they feel the effect on their pockets, right? They don't understand, they don't connect the fact that they're paying more at the gas pump to Putin's invasion. We need to make that connection for them. Yes, you're paying a higher price at the pump, but uh, you're not being shelled right now. This is a small hardship that will help pre prevent much broader hardships in the future. And then finally, we all need to continue to emphasize commonalities. That bravery, that ingenuity, that resilience that Ukrainian people have shown throughout the conflict is something that Europeans, that Westerners, that Americans all have in common with Ukrainians. And so with that 
scene setting, uh, I would love to introduce our really esteemed panel. To my left here, we have Matthew Booth, who you also heard from this morning. He is a communications expert with a background in journalism and media. He's worked in different parts of the UK government for the past decade, including the UK Prime Minister's Office, and is now uh, deployed by the British Embassy in Kiev to support counter disinformation efforts in Ukraine. Matt and I go back for the better part of a decade doing work in Ukraine, so it's a pleasure to be with him here today. Please welcome Matthew. That's where you clap, yes. <laughs> Great, and uh, then we have the very esteemed Evgeny Afinievsky, who is an Oscar and Emmy-nominated director. You probably remember his work of Winter on Fire, uh, which is available still on Netflix today. Also on YouTube. And YouTube, apparently. Um, the the heart-rendering story of the Maidan revolution in Ukraine. His most recent headline-breaking documentary is Freedom on Fire, Ukraine's Fight for Freedom, which you may have seen last night here at World for Ukraine. Uh, of course, he, he earned an Oscar and Emmy nomination for Winter on Fire and has been uh, on the top list for many, many film festivals. We are thrilled to have him here today. Give a hand to Evgeny. Next to Evgeny, we have Sally Jaszczewska, who is a journalist with 10 years of experience in both Poland and abroad. Since the beginning of Russia's full-scale invasion in Ukraine, she has been reporting from that country and is currently wor working on a documentary about U Ukrainian children sent to Russia for a summer camp and their mother's heroic struggle to get them back. Like me, uh, Sally is a IR graduate of Georgetown University and did her BA in anthropology at Oxford University. Please welcome Sally. And we are also joined by two esteemed colleagues online today. Another uh, one of my favorite folks from Ukraine, Yevhen Fedchenko, Dr. Yevhen Fedchenko, the co-founder and chief editor of the fact-checking website stopfake.org, a leading hub of expertise on Russian disinformation. I'm sure you all know it. He is also the director of the Kiev Mohila uh, Academy's School of Journalism and advises on issues relating to tackling disinformation and media literacy. His comments and articles articles have been published in a range of publications, including the New York Times, RFERL, BBC, NPR, and more. And uh, like, uh, like myself, Yevhen was a Fulbright scholar. Yevhen did his Fulbright at USC Annenberg and is now a visiting professor at the Media Risk Center uh, for the University of Pennsylvania. Yevhen, it is good to see you, albeit virtually. And last but not least, a colleague from the United States, James Hope, who is a senior foreign service officer for the U.S. Agency for International Development, which is one of the government agencies involved in many of the United States counter disinformation efforts. James, it's very, very nice to see you. Thanks for joining us. So we're going to kick things off before we get into um, different uh, different portfolios of countering Ukraine fatigue. I wanted to pose um, questions to the whole panel first. And uh, you're all well-traveled people. You've all seen um, how Ukraine fatigue is manifesting itself around the world now as we head toward the second anniversary of the full-scale invasion. In what ways have you seen war fatigue toward Ukraine manifesting in your country or in your industry? Start with you, Evgeny. Uh, I think most of our big Hollywood studios today, they're trying to avoid tackle political stuff. Compared to 2015, when Netflix released Winter on Fire, since you spoke about Winter on Fire. Now, by this time, Netflix was only in 50 countries. Remember that in 16, they entered in the majority of the countries. And today, for example, Netflix trying to exercise more entertainment stuff rather than political stuff. In the last couple of years, we saw that really truth to power stuff is no longer finding a space. I have friends who did many political documentaries and none of them found in the last two, three years home. And I'm talking about Oscar winners, Oscar nominated directors who just not been able to position their movies because of the political content. I think studios trying to avoid uh, any political content these ways. Now, saying that, uh, being said that, this eventually creates completely different bubble in the United States, and beginning of this year, I already heard between some of the members of the Oscar Academy question, is the war is still going? 
And the same question many American people asking, is the war going? From another aspect, we hear about almost every day aspects that Biden sending more aid and more aid, but still, because we're living in a bubble space, because most of our media right now occupied with Trump situation, with Republican fighting among themselves, it's the key element that we see. Remember, if before you open in the news on a TV and news broadcast it, and you can see variety of the news, and you glued to this, let's say, 30, 40, 50 minutes or one hour of the fascinating stories. Today, algorithm, because we're watching most of the news on the internet, today algorithm will give you what you were interested before. And if somebody was glued and yesterday Googling anything what relates to America, he will say America. If somebody who is true in his heart wants to follow Ukraine, yes, he will get some kind of uh, pieces from different places on Ukraine. But majority in U.S. today is way, way far from America. And last year, I, Sean Penn, we had an interesting conversation, and he said, yes, American people, because it's way far from them, they're isolated, and only the real threat can awaken them. And that's, that's the problem that I see. Same way, last year I finished Freedom on Fire, the movie that yesterday was presented here, which I already updated twice. And I did it in six months in order to fight with the war fatigue. I knew that when the war started in 2014, 20th of February 2014, it's not been exposed enough and the world literally neglected eight years which brought to escalation last year. So I didn't want it to go into any further escalation that can happen if we will again neglect the war, which is right now. And again, I as a filmmaker claim it is World War Three. Awaken people with this statement. I want to awaken people because people say, no, it's the conflict. No, it's a World War Three, Hybrid war, World War Three. And you know, I knew that it will end this way, that first two months of the full-scale invasion, we will have full-blown news from coming from Ukraine, and then it will go down. And that was the idea to do the movie. But I saw that none of us who was working on Ukraine found our homes in any of the studios, because nobody wanted to tackle any political content. And studios were afraid of the war fatigue. They don't want it to have any content and potentially will be aggravating their, the subscribers, and they wanted to have more entertainment. And that's, for example, today we are updating for the second time, and I will be releasing, doing self-release, which is mostly common right now among us filmmakers in US and Hollywood, self-release for the 10th anniversary of Maidan, because I know that I need to keep attention on Ukraine, because otherwise, what's the next escalation? Yeah, that's, it's really disheartening to hear that and reminds me very much of when I uh, first started working in Ukraine in 2016 and 2017, you know, three years into the war. Uh, and at that point, advising the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, working with the spokesperson there who so diligently was trying to keep Ukraine in the headlines. And we were told by editor after editor, what's the hook? What's the hook? The hook is that people are dying every day, right? Um, but people around the world have, have forgotten about that. And then, more recently, I just made my first trip back to Ukraine since the, since the full-scale invasion. And so many people, people around me who are quite close to me, who you know, know of my love for Ukraine, and I think, compared to most Americans, know more about Ukraine than the average American. And they still were so scared for me going to Kyiv. And I said, believe me, everything is normal in Kyiv. Things in the East, that's where things are, are really awful right now. But people don't have that context. And that's what I think your films so brilliantly give them. Um, so, so we know what Yevgeny's answer is. Uh, the answer is that we're seeing war fatigue in, uh, in, in industry, uh, in particular in the inter in entertainment industry, which doesn't want to touch these hot button issues. Um, Matt, I wonder w where we're seeing, uh, and perhaps for James as well can come in afterward, where we're seeing uh, war fatigue in government. I realize this is a bit of a self-critical self question, but I'm going to put you on the spot because I think you're up to it. Thanks. Um, yeah, I think I would describe it in the same way as populations and with, uh, with the media as well. I think it's a, 
to sum it up, I would say a creeping normalization, I think. Um, and actually, you've just described, you know, with news editors saying, what's the hook? What's the hook? I, just to backtrack a little bit and pick up on that, I kind of, you know, ha having a background in journalism myself and, and others on the panel, I think it's, um, that is a brutal truth of the industry. You're not going to change that. So it's actually recognizing how you work with that. And I think there is, the reason the industry works like that is because the industry is trying to sell papers or advertising space on their website. Um, and fundamentally, then, they need to tap into human uh, desire to consume novelty and to consume new things. If you read the same thing every day, it doesn't stimulate you. How that applies, I think, to government is, um, yeah, I think, again, it's, it's, it's the same sort of thing. If you're not careful, there is a creeping normalization that these things that were absolutely abhorrent and shocking 18 months ago <clears throat> become just another another thing you've read and another update again and again. And that's quite difficult then to uh, get that under the spotlight of senior decision makers to impress on them kind of how this changes and the, the speed and the rapidity. So um, you're right, this is a challenging question for me to go into too much detail on uh, in a public forum. But I think there is, I would say that is the challenge. The creeping normalization leads to a slowing down of the pace in which decisions are made because it, um, it, it, people can't keep going in crisis mode constantly. But then I think that's the, the realization we do need to have and why we still need to keep using strong language as, as Yevgeny has described because that way you do need to realize, well, we are in crisis mode. There is no other option. We wish we could slow down, but we shouldn't be. We should just keep on going as fast as we can with things. Yeah, absolutely. Ukraine isn't slowing down. That's that's for sure. James, I wonder if we can come to you with that same question. Uh, are you seeing war fatigue manifesting uh, in government in any way, whether it's the U.S. government or, or partners or perhaps other governments that we're trying to get on board with, um, you know, the, the transatlantic alliance and its support of Ukraine? Great, uh, thanks. I hope you can all hear me fine. Uh, thanks for letting me join the panel. Wish I could be there in Jeshuf uh, as well, uh, but uh, greetings from Kyiv. I guess, you know, let me take a slightly different take on this. Uh, you know, one is in the early days when the war first started, I was actually evacuated out to Jeshuf uh, two days before the war started. And right away, one of the first concerns was how long Will the world pay attention to what's happening in Ukraine? And people were concerned about the next natural disaster, the flood, the earthquake, would draw attention and resources away. The next political crisis would draw attention and resources away. And here we are 18 months from now, uh, from then, and actually it, it may not be perfect, but in many ways Ukraine still does dominate the news. It still does it's still the headline uh, on many, many days, whether it's visits to uh, by President Zelensky to Washington or UNGA week or just uh, security and battlefield issues in Ukraine. So the, the story is still there. The story is still live. Um, so that's one point. The other is, you know, what is the hook? And what we see as probably the most compelling hook uh, is taking the what's happening in Ukraine and keeping the narrative in a global context. Uh, so helping the, uh, people understand that, yes, while Ukrainians are literally sacrificing their lives each and every day on the front lines uh, and in cities facing rocket attacks about and, and fighting for Ukraine's sovereignty and independence and freedom, that is critical and important for Ukraine, but it also has a much larger impact. And a few folks mentioned earlier, or actually you did in your introductory remarks about the impact of the war in Ukraine on global food security, uh, the impact I would add on uh, energy security in the region uh, or in the world. And in general, at the highest level, just sort of the broad protection of democratic values and institutions and systems that, uh, that uh, are important for all of us. And so keeping what's happening in Ukraine uh, on that global scale, on that global level, uh, is a still, in my opinion, a very uh, powerful hook. And I'll close with just a challenge. What I see is not so much the fatigue in terms of how much resource and attention is being paid. The resources were 18 months into this, and the scale uh, of uh, what's being done to support Ukraine uh, has gotten to a very large, complex level. And the challenge right now is how to coordinate that how to uh, ensure that what's being done is supportive, 
not duplicating, that funds are protected, all of these sort of uh, more mature questions uh, uh, in responding to a conflict. And that's, to me, that's where the challenge is right now. That's, that was uh, a, both true diplomatic remarks. I think I, I'll editorialize a little bit as, as the non-government affiliated American on the panel. One of my worries as we head into 2024 is that the issue of Ukraine, uh, not only in the United States, but among so many nations where elections are, are coming up next year, is that Ukraine is going to be politicized and this issue of funding and supporting Ukraine is going to be on the ballot. Um, so that is something that I will be vociferously advocating uh, against that we shouldn't be using Ukraine as a political football because Ukraine deserves our support no matter who uh, is in any position of power. I do want to turn to, to Sally and Yevhen um, to talk about uh, journalism's role. Um, how are you seeing, we've talked about this a little bit, right? If it bleeds, it leads. We know that old adage. We know uh, what's the hook. But what are the, what are the ways, perhaps the more... Um, uh, under the radar ways that we're seeing uh, Ukraine fatigue materializing in the journalistic community, if at all. And we'll turn to some, some more positive things in just a second, but uh, I, wanna, I wanna focus on the problem and then we'll talk about how we solve it. So let's start with Sally and then we'll go to Yevhen. Uh, absolutely, but before we, uh, sorry, before we, <laughs> Uh, before we discuss that, I just wanted to uh, reference what, what you said earlier. I really like the Foucault reference, uh, speaking truth to power. The question, of course, is where the power lies, who, who has the power. And of course, in case of Poland at the moment, it's going to be the people. Because we have um, elections coming up on October 15th, a very similar situation, but I would say um, more imminent than in the US, right? Because uh, you have that in 2024. And Ukraine has been a widely politicized, right? So the way we also cover Ukraine in the media is quite significant because a lot of things can be, um, can be twisted in some ways, right, by, by, other, um, by, by other people. So, um, well, how to prevent uh, war fatigue? Uh, Poland went out of its way, really, to support Ukraine in the early days of the war. Uh, according to quite recent data, um, since the beginning of the war, over 15 million people from Ukraine crossed through the Polish borders. Of course, not all of them stayed in Poland, right? But it was, it, and it still is an important point of transit. Uh, not only regarding people, but also uh, the unfortunate case of um, the grain, right? The recent, uh, the recent issue, um, and other uh, and transport of weapons as well, right? Uh, to to Ukraine. So uh, Poland has been playing an important part. Uh, what I can see in the uh, public dialogue is that I think that certain element in the Polish society they you know, don't feel appreciated by the Ukrainian side, right, for, for what Poland has done so far with uh, these uh, recent um, conflicting narratives and so on, right? We've all um, know about this. Uh, now, regarding our coverage of what is going on in Ukraine. So at the very start, of course, it was our problem, right? And, and sort of bringing another a reference from anthropology, it's us, versus others, right? So to what extent Ukraine is us, and to what extent is it somebody else's problem, right? So at the very beginning, it was clearly our problem, right? Things are going, uh, going on right behind our border. Uh, so, so, so Poland uh, took an active part, supported Ukraine, and is still supporting Ukraine. Uh, but I feel uh, that because of the, um, the, these different other factors, right, and the uh, upcoming elections, this issue has been politicized, as you've mentioned. Um, regarding the media, so um, we're trying, I mean, at least at um, our station, TVP World, we've been trying to, to cover uh, two aspects. A, a, what is going on on the front lines. We have a special program devoted to it. It's called Military Mind. And we actually have um, uh, news feeds from soldiers who are on the front lines, from social media and so on, just to give people uh, a sort of an honest account of what has been going on. And this has been quite, this particular show has been quite popular. Uh, another one is Break the Fake, where we deal with the Russian narrative, right? We have um, prominent Russian journalists such as uh, Solovyov, who are, uh, you know, uh, uh, peddling a certain narrative that is not, um, well, not truthful, I mean, simply put, right? So we have been trying to debunk uh, some, of, uh, some of this. Um, now, the question, of course, when do we get tired of things? Uh, it, it's, a, it's a vital question. 
and I would like to really uh, give you an example of Syria, right? There we have a war that has been going on for 12 years now. Um, and if you Google war in Syria, there will be this one question, is the war in Syria still going on? So a lot of people stopped following the conflict. They got confused, perhaps by too many facts. Uh, and of course, we have the Arab world now uh, readmitting, right, Bashar al-Assad uh, to uh, the Arab League and sort of he's re-emerging uh, on, uh, on the political scene. So I wonder when will that happen for Vladimir Putin, if ever? Uh, what can we do to prevent the same situation happening in the case of Ukraine as has happened in the case of Syria? Uh, and uh, regarding that example, uh, another thing is that even um, regarding politicians, right? Uh, recently, even the um, EU chief of diplomacy, Joseph Borrell, said that, you know, while Syria is no longer uh, in the headlines, we're still supporting it, but he has openly admitted that, right? So, so I wonder, what is the time span that we have to, that we can use? When will people really get tired? Um, and of course, well, images are one thing, but how to, you know, cover the war in Ukraine in a, um, in a certain tactical manner so that it really uh, keeps being relevant for the people? Because at, at this point, right, for a lot of people, a lot of uh, members of the general public, it is associated with a problem, right, of people taking away jobs, um, you know, uh, food prices going up, uh, fuel prices going up. So how to explain to, to a very, um, to very general audience, right, what the problem is. So we've been trying to do that, um, I guess successfully to some extent, but the question remains open for how long uh, will that be relevant and what can we do to, to strengthen this uh, narrative? Well, that sets us up for, for the second part of our conversation. But first, I want to turn to Yevgen and ask him the same question. What ways are you uh, seeing uh, war fatigue mani manifesting in journalism right now, uh, perhaps even within Ukraine? I think you offer a, a unique perspective uh, in that regard. Uh, yeah, I think uh, sooner or later we would come to the problem of, of, of fatigue. I'm not sure that this is now a time for that, because I still see a lot of uh, interest coming from uh, journalists and media. Uh, but as a journalist, I was covering a lot of conflicts around the world, and I uh, would always expect that sooner or later there would be uh, this period when journalists would start looking for something else, what else we want to cover, and uh, even now we see how they want to find uh, some different angles, how to look at the war in Ukraine. And very often they come very unfavorable angles for uh, covering the war in Ukraine already, uh, just because they want the change of perspective uh, as a way of how media operating. And on another hand, we should always remember that even if there is uh, no fatigue, Russian disinformation is working 24 hours a day to create this feeling of Ukraine's fatigue. And they uh, try to impose that feeling on the audiences uh, and try to uh, create the political context for that fatigue to appear as well. So, for example, we would see the topic of Ukraine to be very uh, active during electoral campaign, as you said, in different, very different parts of the world in the United States, but also the European Parliament elections coming next year, also elections in many European countries as well. So that would be a very big uh, challenge, uh, how Ukrainian topic would be used uh, by, by media, by different political forces. And uh, I think the, the, the only answer here is to uh, put Ukraine uh, in the global agenda, as it was said uh, by other people on this panel, and uh, keep it uh, there and also on another hand to prevent uh, uh, Russia from uh, hijacking the, the narrative war uh, because I think this is the expectation of Putin and, and, and Russia that as soon as time would go on people would care less and less about Ukraine because the first shock of Bucha, Irpin, war crimes would go, that's their expectation and then they would impose their own political agenda based on the, the very different objectives. 
And uh, that's why now we see how they try to increase their presence uh, in media, explaining that, you know, this is Putin's war, there are many other Russians and Russians around, or how they try to still uh, reinvent themselves within some public diplomacy efforts, if we can call that that way, you know. We see how Russia is returning to cultural life, to sports activities. So this is their expectation. They expect fatigue, and they expect the shock is going somewhere, and then they, they, they just expect things to, to become uh, business as usual, or usual business. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, it was very clear from the beginning. In fact, Russia was quite overt about their intention for this to be a war of attrition and for uh, the, the, the public and politicians around the world to become increasingly fatigued. They said this uh, in their communications very, very early on. So now I, I do want to, that was a great segue. Thank you, Yevgen. I want to turn to the whole panel and say, uh, you know, ask what, what role Kremlin disinformation and influence operations are playing in encouraging Ukraine fatigue and war fatigue? I've given a couple of examples, but I'm sure you each have a personal story of, uh, of how Russian disinformation has played in. And I'll, I'll start again with Yevgen, because I'm sure, uh, Yevgeny, because I'm sure you've, you've dealt with it uh, very much in, in your own personal work. Yes, but first of all, in my last movie, I specifically in Freedom, I tried to emphasize both sides of this current war. Again, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, World War III is the hybrid war. On one side, we have missiles and bombs that are killing people. On another side, the media have been weaponized. The camera became a weapon. And unfortunately, the world don't understand that for propaganda to get into the European Union, it's not, not need Schengen. To get into the United States, it's easy passing our customs and our borders, and it's there. And people don't understand that we are living in the World War III. And the hybrid aspect of this war is a, the reality that the world still don't understand. And yes, I can give you a classical example from a previous elections. Unfortunately, in America, people are lazy. Lazy because I saw how the journalists working hard when they're doing a fact check. And I will give you a story that happened in front of my eyes during the elections. It was we are just uh, finished uh, Jewish New Year. And it was a Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, September, when the Biden was running for the office. And on a Facebook, in one of the Jewish Israeli groups, was a post of um, Biden's tweet, what it said, uh, from me to all my Jewish friends, I wish them happy Rosh Hashanah and Hag Purim Sameach, two different holidays, actually. And then you have a bunch of comments where, oh, how stupid he is, how he can be our president. We can't vote for him. And it's continuous, continuous, continuous. And I saw how many of my friends automatically just adding because they saw some of their other friends adding the comments. So there is no fact check. It's just a snowball that going on and on and on. Because we used to, okay, if my friends retweeted something, then it's fine. We used to do these things. For me, no longer. I am doing fact check. I worked with the journalists when I was covering Syria, when did Christ from Syria, where specifically my friend said to me, you need to literally trust yourself doing the fact check for every footage that you're getting from outsources. And for me, it was a great example. When I went to the real Twitter of, uh, of by this time, it was Joe Biden who was running for the president. And I went to his Twitter and I found a completely different tweet. It was a tweet that says, from me and Kamala, from my wife and her husband, I wish to all my Jewish friends, Hag Rosh Hashanah Sameach. That's it. It's nothing what I saw on the Facebook. And that's a classical example of the social media being weaponized. Now, in my movie that was presented yesterday, the movie that currently basically companion piece to Winter on Fire, it's called Freedom on Fire. And I specifically emphasize in freedom because freedom has two meanings. It's a freedom of speech and the freedom that a Ukrainian nation is fighting today for the future. So at the end of the day, Freedom of speech been suppressed in Russia and camera been weaponized. And for me, it was important to emphasize this in the movie. 
both sides of the war. So for me, the propaganda that again, Joseph Goebbels invented this. Hitler posted this wrote in his book, The uh, Theory of Big Lie. That's what is used today. Take a lie big enough, repeat it over and over, it becomes truth. And actually, the same theory of big lie continues in the same statement it says, lie is an enemy of the truth. And by the extension, it's an enemy of the state. So in the state, state need to do everything in their power to so basically to fight the truth. So that's what Russia does, and that's what Russia trying to do not just inside of their territory, but across the globe. Mm -hmm, absolutely. And, you know, as you were uh, saying that, I, I've thought back to some of my own experience uh, being at the center of conspiracy theories and harassment campaigns. And it occurred to me that actually Yevhen and I, uh, Fedchenko and I, uh, are at the center of some conspiracy theories that people say about us. Because when I lived in Ukraine, I appeared on Stop Fake several times. And apparently, that makes us part of a global conspiracist cabal that supports neo Nazis in Ukraine. <laughs> It's I'm as a Jewish, yeah. I'm supporting neo-Nazis. Yes, uh, yes, and, and Zelensky himself is a neo-Nazi. All of these, of course, are uh, not only Russian disinformation, they're disinformation that sometimes makes its way into our own societies and then supports the amplification of further war fatigue. Uh, Sally, I don't know if you have any, any perhaps, examples. I know there's been, um, in particular, some uh, Russian disinformation targeting um, historical... Um, uh, challenges in the Polish-Ukrainian relationship. Perhaps you can speak about some of those or something else. Uh, r right. Well, uh, I wanted to talk about that as well, but I wanted to start with, of course, uh, one name, Tucker Carlson. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, some other pundits who are actually enabling this kind of, uh, you know, narrative to exist uh, in the virtual space, right? So when Mr. Carlson was uh, kicked off Fox News, he moved uh, to Twitter now X, uh, and Elon Musk has said that, oh, he's glad, right? And he would like to see other, uh, perhaps representatives of other um, political viewpoints here on X. Uh, and I think, you know, people such as Elon Musk are quite an interesting example how you are a tech billionaire, but also by extension, you become very influential, not only by what you're publishing on, on the website of your company, right, Twitter slash X, uh, but also being able to interfere in the conflict itself uh, via the control of Starlink, right? So um, who should control people like that? I mean, where does their you know, mandate to, to, to do something and, uh, and I think this is, uh, this is, of course, an open question. Um, regarding uh, Polish-Ukrainian history, I mean, some of this has been, uh, of course, uh, weaponized, but I think the most, uh, I mean, one thing that all of these narratives have in common is creating a threat, right, and sort of creating that division. So a threat can be created by an influx of Ukrainian uh, refugees, right? look, they're trying to steal your jobs, right? I mean, do something about this, right? Uh, and of course, um, uh, things such as uh, the uh, Volynia massacre, right? There were, uh, uh, of course, uh, we share painful history but with a lot of countries, right? The, the question is how you deal with that uh, history. Uh, now we had this unfortunate uh, case. I mean, this, in this case, it was, it was true, right? And caused the uh, Canadian um, uh, Speaker of the House to, to resign from his position, right? Mr. Rota, because of um, this um, Ukrainian um, war veteran who, un well, who served, uh, who worked for a Nazi um, SS Galicia, right? So the, the, the fact that the Canadian government did not do their fact-checking, right, caused this whole story to snowball and again uh, sort of, you know, slapped Poland in the face despite of what uh, Poland has been doing for, for Ukraine. So I think, you know, some of these are genuine cases. Some of it is fabricated. Also, the, the, the sort of the way you deal with these narratives, the way you, you know, give them credibility, extend their uh, lifespan, so to speak, right, in the media, this, this matters as well.
Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I think this is a big misunderstanding about disinformation writ large. People think that disinformation is often cut and dry false, and that's just not true. It, there's often a kernel of truth um, that is either you know, presented in a misleading fashion or uh, that is presented out of context, and then people don't do their due diligence, as you've just uh, outlined. But I want to turn now, um, as we turn to our, our two government representatives here, I want to turn to solutions. So one of the things that I think worked really well at the beginning of the full scale invasion was the declassification of intelligence and the communications campaigns that came out of the, the US and the UK, uh, those joint communications campaigns that were able to um, give uh, basically you know, information weaponry to organizations like mine at the Center for Information Resilience where we said, okay, the US and the UK have said, that there are going to be false flag operations coming. When we have our investigators out there looking on social media, we were then able to identify, for instance, a quote unquote car bomb that Russia had said uh, Ukraine sent into occupied territory, where actually no one had died. They blew up a car and had put some cadavers in it, and we were able to identify that using the footage. That sort of declassification was really, really, um, really helpful for civil society organizations and I think for journalists as well. I would, I would love to hear how you guys reacted to it, but for me, uh, at that point in my career, when I was speaking with journalists, briefing them about the conflict, I got a lot of pushback. They were saying, do you think this is real? This is coming from the governments that said there were WMDs in Iraq. And I said, you know what, I do think it's real because I know civil servants like Matt, like James, who, who were doing so much work to get that intel declassified at that point, the, the amount of work that that took. Um, and I think the effect that it had was, was you know, uh, it can't be understated at the beginning of the war. And, and the, um, the movement that that created for the coalition around, around Ukraine. So I'd love to hear, um, we'll turn to James first, about, about anything that you think um, the government can be doing in, in terms of that sort of strategic communications, um, you, you know, the view from the inside from the beginning of the war, and, and perhaps what efforts, if you're able to talk about them, are going on now to push back against uh, Russian disinformation and Ukraine fatigue from within the government. Sure, thanks. I mean, I think, you know, the starting point, too, I think we have to recognize the tremendous capacity on the part of Ukraine uh, and its various efforts to counter disinformation, including via social media channels, uh, but much, much more. And so the starting point uh, is definitely not zero. Uh, and there's a tremendous effort on the part of the government of Ukraine and other parts of uh, Ukrainian society to counter all of these disinformation themes that we're talking about right now. I mean, I guess a couple of comments. One is, you know, one of the, the subjects that sort of might get traction or, ten, or can get traction on uh, disinformation channels is about how is all of the assistance to Ukraine being used? Uh, and are funds being diverted? Are funds being stolen or misused in some way? And so sometimes, as you noted, there can be a kernel of truth uh, that then gets twisted and, and morphed into uh, a different purpose. And so, for example, uh, some of the U.S. inspector generals uh, announced, came to Kyiv, and they announced that they were establishing a hotline to improve transparency and, and the accessibility for ordinary citizens to report waste or, or allegations or things like that. And, of course, that led to a wave of... Uh, of disinformation about a, a tremendous level of misuse of funds and disinformation and things like that. Uh, so, you know, that's uh, a real, it's a tricky issue and, and how to get at it is, you know, there's no magic bullet here, but what we focus on is really reflects some of the themes that are coming out. The role of media and making sure that media has an opportunity to continue to do the work that it does. And this is a, a tough time just from a, a business sense for a lot of the media entities and the same with civil society. Uh, so a lot of our assistance in this area is focused on ensuring that uh, civil society groups and media and journal individual journalists can continue to provide that role, whether it's telling the truth and the story from the front line or whether it's in uh, the countering disinformation sphere. And the, the second part is how to help preserve uh, the sort of sense of national unity in Ukraine, uh, this unprecedented level of national unity that is constantly under threat uh, through disinformation and, and many other ways. And so working almost on a softer side to help uh, communities preserve cultural heritage 
uh, to help uh, young people learn and understand true Ukrainian history. These may seem like small, unimportant things, but it really is helping build the resilience uh, and to help counter uh, a lot of this aggressive disinformation uh, that's out there every day. Over. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for, for all that information. And I think all of that is, uh, is frankly music to my ears. And I would absolutely agree on the communications coming from the Zelensky administration earlier in the, the morning panel, I was talking about that. And so turning to Matt, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the efforts uh, that you're, you're undertaking um, with the Ukrainian government to, to make sure that communications both on the international stage and um, domestically in Ukraine uh, continue to push back on war fatigue. Sure. Um, I think what I would do is come back to your kind of opening point on this, or when, when you asked about the declassification of documents at the beginning of the full-scale invasion. And while I wasn't involved in that particular piece of work, I think what, why I wanted to mention that is because it touches on something that we spoke about this morning on this morning's panel, which is that by coming out on the front foot and saying, this is what the situation is, it makes it very difficult to the point of being impossible for the Russians or another bad actor to say, this is what the situation is. Well, no, we've already covered that. We've already been clear, this is what it is. It, there's, there's less fertile ground for those uh, untruthful narratives to set foot. And so I think a large part of my work um, is supporting that, is supporting the mechanisms and the processes to be able to clearly articulate what government policies are, how they benefit citizens and society, how that relates to the rest of the world, and being very clear and front-footed on saying, this is who we are, this is what we are doing, this is what we stand for, this is why we're doing it. Um, you're never gonna get that perfect 100% of the time. It's an ongoing, continual uh, process, which takes a lot of time and resource and, and energy, but it's, I think, vitally important. And um, I would come back to, uh, it was something that Jim mentioned um, around uh, historical truths. And I would, I would agree with that and I would expand on that as well. I think at the beginning you asked about in government what are the challenges and I, I mentioned, uh, what did I say, two words about um, creeping normalization. That's right. The other thing I would add on to that though as well is the um, ignorance. Ignorance about not just Ukraine but like this part of the world in general. So, um, you know, you mentioned for example historical things, the Volin massacres. This is not something that, and you know, 18 months ago, your average Westerner did not have a clue about that period of history, and probably they still don't. Um, the ones that do will have a kind of different idea of it from whatever thing they read on Twitter, perhaps. You know, maybe someone went and fact check it on Wikipedia. And I think that's really testimony to the power of decades of, uh, of Soviet management of the region, of, of, the, of the power of the Iron Curtain. There is still a, a, a real, question mark over this part of the world for most people, it, even in Europe, let alone then when you start to get into South America and Africa and into Oceania and Asia. Like, so I think there is a, a piece here where, you know, can you expect your average, uh, average citizen, even in, even in Europe, um, to be an expert on 1950s political history in the west of Ukraine? Like, no, of course you can't. Um, but I think there is a point here around clearly defining what is, what is true and what is not um, and, and having that open and accessible. But I think that's dealing with the history. There is also what comes next. And I think Ukraine has got so much to offer as a country. It's one of the reasons I fell in love with the place within like 12 hours of being there. The food is absolutely amazing. The fashion's really cool. The artists are amazing. The comedy's really funny. The music's great. There's so much stuff that Ukraine can be telling to the world stage, this is who we are. And then the more they are able and empowered to do that, and the more we can all support them as allies to do that, the harder it is for Russians to say, this is who they are, and this is where it is. You know, and I, I'm really, I'm, I'm, I do agree with Jim's point around sort of historical narratives and historical truths, but I'm really interested in uh, moving away from coming back to the topic, we're talking about Ukraine fatigue, but we're not really, we're talking about Ukraine war fatigue. Ukraine still, most of the world still doesn't really know about. And there's so many cool stories that they can find out and know about. And I, I'd be, I would love to do pieces of work where, um, and I'm not, by the way, because I haven't got enough money. But I would, love, <laughs> I would love to do things where we're taking, you know, for example, fashion journalists and fashion bloggers from West Africa and taking them to meet, uh, to go and do pieces around Ukraine's fashion industry. Mm. 
because then you're talking about Ukraine and Ukraine's culture. And of course, you can't then talk about that within the current context of the fact that they're having an illegal invasion and that they're fighting a war, but they still got this amazing creative space. Mm. If you keep on going with those stories again and again and again and again, you're expanding the understanding and you're removing this fertile ground of ignorance, which is where the Russians are able to just plonk disinformation everywhere they want to. Absolutely, and I always tell my friends back home that the fashions that we're all wearing today, you know, the big chunky shoes and the flowy pants and big coats, they were happening in Ukraine in 2016. So uh, fashion in, in, in Ukraine is certainly avant-garde. I want to turn to Evgeny, um, because I think we have a nice segue into art. Um, obviously, Ukraine has a lot to offer the world culturally, but, but what role as, a, as an artist, as a director and filmmaker, do you see in, in not only combating war fatigue generally, which has been kind of, I would say, your, your work for the past 10 years, but um, in contributing to, to building, a, as Matt was talking about, a, a more well-rounded image of Ukraine, and you've, you've kind of touched on this as well, uh, with relation to Russia's cultural diplomacy. So, so what are the opportunities and challenges there? First of all, I think with Winter on Fire, I try to show this interesting variety of what happens on Maidan. Because if you're going back to Winter on Fire, I try to show the cultural aspects, the people <laughs> we're talking about different sotnias that were brigades that were having different tasks on Maidan, and I try to show different aspects. Now, I, I think since Maidan, I personally was fascinated. Uh, Matt said he fell in love in 12 hours. I fall in love being in Maidan because, you know what, as a kid who was raised in Israel and saw how multi faith basically different religion groups trying to fight over Jerusalem, I was fascinated to see this interface dialogue that happened there on Maidan. For me, seeing how church saved the lives of the students who are technically atheists, to see that side by side, different uh, heads of different churches were on Maidan together was fascinating. So Ukraine have a lot to offer and to offer and to inspire, actually. And I try to bring it in all my movies. You know, when I was uh, challenging myself how I will start Freedom on Fire, I was thinking, how should I start the movie about the war? And uh, I was thinking, journalistically, yes, a movie about the war, any segment you start in with some images of the war. And I was thinking, okay, everybody saw the Bridge of Arpain, Bucha. I don't want to scare my audience when the lights going on in the cinema. And you know what I did? I started with stand-up comedy. Stand-up comedy in a bunker. Bombs are outside and people laughing. Laughing at the war. Laughing at the, the craziness of Russian propaganda. Laughing at uh, all these crazy lies that they're spraying. And people laughing. I wanted to show resilience. I wanted to show... I have kids who joking about the war and i wanted to show that no matter what ukrainians have resilience you have they have a sense of humor they have life they have culture they're not victims they're heroes and i think that's what i artistically try to bring despite that i also telling the story of the war and i think as an artist it's important to me because again war fatigue a movie about the war no it's a movie about humanity it's a movie about human nation that are fighting about their future and to show their human spirit who is still very high so i think as an artist for me i try to express it i try to find this among all these horrors that we do see in, in the news specifically in europe in the u.s uh, less but in europe you do see in this in the tv stations and you know what i try to implement this as an artist and I feel good about this because I am bringing the true soul of the nation. So as an artist, I think that's what I try to achieve. Thank you. Yeah, I think that humanity is, is uh, at least in the paper that, that we wrote, you know, one of the most important things, telling those human stories so that... Uh, the citizens who may be, again, a bit angry that their gas prices or grain prices have gone up, um, that, you know, they're, they're doing this for a reason, that there's some connection there. And I think that's, that's where things connect a little bit back to, to broadcast and print journalism as well. Um, you know, back during the days of the Kosovo War, um, a lot of the West didn't care very much about what was going on in Kosovo until that very famous image of the man 
behind the barbed wire in, in the camp in Kosovo was, was shown. And I'm wondering, for Yevhen and, uh, and for Sally, has that image come out yet? I mean, obviously, Bucha and Irpin were, were very, you know, um, and I would love Yevgeny's opinion on this, too, um, influenced how people thought of Ukraine. But with this constant flow of images, too, how do we, how do we make sure that Ukraine, A, stays in the headlines, and B, that people don't get inured to this type of suffering on the Mariupol and, and Bakhmut level? Yeah, Yevgeny. But I will tell you something, what was important to me when I did a movie on Syria, since you mentioned today Syria, I saw how the ordinary people who were watching the movie on HBO were closing the TV. I had people leaving the cinema because of the super graphic images. When Bucha was uncovered, and I do have images uh, of Bucha in the movie, and um, in fact, one of the people from the self-defense describing how Russia was fighting these images, accusing Ukrainians in a, basically faking them, and the full explanation is in the movie. You know what, I was very careful because like I just said, I wanted to show humanity on the Ukrainian side and less imaginary uh, of the gra graphic images because I wanted to make emotional connection less than the visual uh, disasters. I wanted to make people to be able to see and to being able to be sitting on the seats of the cinema and watch the movie from A to Z. Because for me, any movie that I do, it's a comprehensive story from uh, with the beginning, middle, and end. And I wanted people to be educated through my movie, to get connected to my characters. I had to take a conversation with an uh, amazing person who received an award yesterday on the stage, Valeria Pali, and she said, you able to, co to make in your movie that any person can find something that will be connected to him. Any audience can find themselves in your movie. And yes, I wanted to show ordinary people, happy Ukrainian ordinary people fighting for their future. Yes, it's tough to be under the Azov still. Yesterday I had my protagonist with me. But still, she believes and she fights. And she has a high spirit to fight for her child. So I think uh, here I was playing kind of devil's advocate with myself and trying to every time wait what is good to show and what is not. And I found the main topic for me is humanity. Human spirit, that's what's leading my movie. Uh, right, I fully agree. Just putting a human face on a problem, right? So the, the, the image you've mentioned, also the, another image of uh, one of the refugees arriving uh, in Europe, right? You, you, you had that child that died as a result, but it was a particular person. Uh, so this is also what we've been trying to do, working on uh, our documentary about uh, mothers who, who send their kids to, to Russia for a summer camp, right? It's not just mothers as a collective. We have individuals whose stories we follow, whose emotions we're trying to show. And I think this is, uh, this is very important, just to put a human face on, on the problem, right? It's a story of Luda or it's a story of Maria, but it's not a story of some general public experiencing um, a, a tragedy. Uh, another thing uh, that you've mentioned, uh, you both mentioned uh, Bucha, and I actually find quite puzzling. We encountered uh, one of the um, inhabitants of Bucha who was actually documenting uh, the crime as it was happening. He was taking pictures of, of bodies scattered uh, all over this, this, this small town before uh, they, were, uh, they were buried and so on, right after the tragedy, which was extremely uh, courageous, right, because he could uh, easily uh, have become a, a victim himself. Uh, but my question also is about how the UN has dealt with, with Bucha and with Izium, saying that it wasn't really a genocide, right, and sort of how the international community can sometimes, by sticking to certain, perhaps, well, requirements that they, I'm sure they had, right, but then really undermine the, you know, people suffering and enable this other dialogue to go on, right? Because if they said, listen, this is a genocide, then perhaps it would be a wake-up call to some people, to some audiences, right? So I also... Yeah, I suppose that's a, that's a point that we don't really have represented on stage here today. What about multilateral organizations, international organizations, and their role in combating war fatigue? And certainly, uh, you know, we had a, a great moment uh, at UNGA 
uh, last week, and I'm now forgetting which representative. It was Albania, wasn't it? Um, the Albanian representative said, if you don't want Mr. Zelensky to come speak Russian Federation, the simplest thing is for you to pull out of Ukraine right now, and then he won't need to come speak. Um, but I, I, I agree that there could be more vociferous uh, condemnations of what's going on in Ukraine from international organizations like the UN. Uh, Yevhen, I pro promised I would turn to you, so I'm wondering, uh, in, in terms of images, in terms of um, journalistic uh, combating of, of war fatigue, what more would you like to see? What more can the journalistic community do? Uh, you know, it's uh, very weird, but uh, it all depends on what audiences you really want to reach out, because, for example, on Twitter or Home Twitter, you still can find groups where they seriously discuss if there is a war in Ukraine. And all uh, arguments that there are more than 14,000 journalists now presented in Ukraine and seen everything with their own eyes and documented every second of this war and all those crimes, it's, it's, that's not enough for them. And they are still seriously discussing because as I said, we still don't have any evidences. So we live now in the environment where the, the words like evidences and crimes really sometimes are losing their boundaries depending on what audiences are really discussing those issues. So I, I, I think we really need to cater to those audiences who are still operating on the kind of factual basis of, of, of this discussion. And for, for this, we still, Stop Fake is doing that for, for almost 10 years already. And we still find a huge audience for those people who want facts and want us to debunk all those fake stories. And now we see how Ukraine is using all those debunked stories in international institutions like UN to prove what actually happened uh, because the uh, trust which we have is an important factor to prove what is true and what is not. So we want also to share this experience of building resilience uh, against disinformation with other countries, other governments, and that's what we actively uh, do right now and actually it helps uh, also to beat this future fatigue because as it was said this uh, disinformation is building this feeling of fatigue based on three main sectors or three main narratives one is about uh, mishandling of uh, western weapons which are supplied to ukraine that ukraine is not using them properly is not trained properly to use them is selling them on the black market the second category is this manage, mismanagement of uh, financial assets which Ukraine is provided with. And the third great segment is all about Ukrainian refugees in different parts of the world. So we see the growing number of fake stories portraying Ukraine refugees as uh, conflicting entities struggling with the receiving communities uh, in different countries, including in Poland. I think there are the, the biggest number of stories portraying Ukrainian refugees in Poland in a very negative way. And the number of those stories is growing because Russia really wants to build this uh, glass wall uh, between Ukraine and Ukraine partners and allies. And this is one of the main objectives. Also, we want to share our knowledge about how Russian disinformation system is built, uh, because now we, we are operating uh, in European countries and we see how Russia is redesigning its uh, disinformation ecosystem. Instead of one big centralized system, we see how they grown uh, domestically built uh, smaller uh, systems, which are very closely related to domestic political milieu, and they are not openly connected to Russia per se. Uh, they are operating around local political issues and they want to build the system of divide, political divide in those countries. And to some extent, uh, people in governments in many parts of the world are still uh, very naive uh, about uh, the uh, malign uh, influence of those systems on their political systems in the first stage. So it's even not about Ukraine. So we just want to share our knowledge because I think Ukraine has the biggest knowledge about this. And uh, also we are building our 
physical presence in different parts of the world because this is very, very important to map Ukraine globally. You cannot do that distantly. You, you, you can deliver this information distantly, but you cannot uh, build your uh, public diplomacy uh, and other uh, important instruments uh, distantly. You need to be there. So, for example, for this, you uh, stop fake open the uh, Spanish language hub in Spain for Spain and Latin, Latin American countries. So we want to work more with uh, global south. We work with uh, Francophone African countries, for example. We work with uh, Turkish audience uh, providing our content in Turkish. And uh, I think that's what Ukraine should do more and more increasingly. We, uh, it's one thing is to, to, to beat Russian disinformation narratives, but then you, you cannot leave that vacuum because, again, Russia would immediately fill it with what they want to fill it. You need to come over there and fill it with your own Ukrainian narratives, and that's why it's important to keep Ukraine at the global scale. Wow, that was a great, I think, summation of many of the themes that we talked about today. And I, I just want to piggyback on a couple of things. Um, first, uh, relating to those that you may encounter on the internet who believe that the war in Ukraine isn't real and that it's all, all faked by the CIA or something like that. Um, I direct you to eyesonrussia.org, which uh, I mentioned at the beginning of, of, I think, of this panel, or it may have been the other one. It's been a long day. Um, and that is our uh, multi-organizational effort to track the war in Ukraine. Again, we take social media footage, other footage that we find, satellite imagery, and we're able to chronolocate and geolocate all of those incidents. So for the people who are saying there's no real d destruction, there's no real damage, um, that's an open source database where journalists, citizens, whomever can query that. Um, and you, it's all open source. So they can, they can, we show our work, they can recreate it themselves if they feel so inclined. And that's one of the, I think, greatest ways um, that we've been able to combat uh, these, these false narratives about the lack of a conflict in Ukraine. Uh, and for the last panel, uh, last question for the panel before we open it up to Q&A for the audience, I, I just want to ask, what's your, what's your one wish as we head toward, obviously, you know, we all wish for victory, but toward the second, uh, second anniversary of the war, um, if there's one thing that you could snap your fingers and change in your industry, uh, what would you wish for? I think everyone's going to say more money. <laughs> so you're not allowed to say that. Uh, I'll start with Matt. In lieu of having more money, I think, uh, as Yevhen just mentioned, I think a, it's been nearly a decade now talking to people about disinformation. And as we, as we sort of discussed this earlier, reports on disinformation, this, we've been looking at the problem, we've been studying the techniques, yada, yada, okay, great, what are you going to do about it? And I, I think we're really at that stage now. For me, my one wish would be I don't want to have to keep convincing uh, stakeholders with whom I work closely in, in various different organizations around the world that this is a problem. It objectively is a problem. We know it. We know it very well. We know what the problem is. We know what we need to do to tackle it. So get your wallet out and give Great. them the money. Uh, let's turn to uh, Yevgeny and then we'll go to the folks on the screen and then have Sally close us out before we go to uh, questions from the audience. Yevgeny. Uh, second anniversary of the full-scale invasion. Yes, because, uh, of course. It's the 10th anniversary of the war. Yes. Uh, sorry to correct you. Uh, what I wish, I wish more openness from the audience to uh, be willing to learn and to pay attention to something that, despite its happen again, I'm talking from the perspective of the American and American nation and the audience of the West who are way, way far from the conflict. Here, it's local and people more paying attention. I'm talking about completely isolated part of the world, which is the United States. And for me, I do want to see more ability of the American nation to open their eyes, open their brains, became less lazy, and not just take everything what they see on a social media, but to be more uh, cautious when they're reading something and willing to just spend a little bit time and to learn is it true or not and that's what I will because then you know what we will not have mistakes during our elections we will not have situations that for the last years we are living in the United States and I think that's what I wish amen James let's go to you 
Sure. Well, I mean, I think the obvious answer for everyone is, you know, victory. Uh, but beyond that, and specifically what we're talking about, you know, I, the worry is, in my opinion, less about the fatigue and support for Ukraine right now during this sort of help Ukraine win the war stage. It's really about the win the future stage. And if I could wish for something, it would be that the same level of resources and financial support and moral support and diplomatic and political support wherever, from whatever part of the world, including from the United States, that that will continue uh, after a victory in a post-war environment where the, the worry and the tendency is going to be for focus and attention to go elsewhere. And that's actually when Ukraine is going to need the support uh, even more in a way than it does now. Absolutely. Let's, let's not uh, repeat the mistakes of the post-communist period, I think. Uh, Yevhen, over to you. Uh, yeah, as I said, I'm working a lot now with um, audiences in Spanish, and we had a, a roundtable with Spanish journalists, and they said one very important thing for me as a journalist. So they said, after what we've seen in Bucha, we cannot talk anymore about neutrality of journalism. So I think this is a feeling which journalism should, should keep about any conflict, and especially about war in Ukraine. And as I said, this first shock should not just go away, you know, and we should forget about everything what we've seen. It should be a clear signal that by staying neutral, you cannot solve uh, any problem, you cannot stop any war by staying neutral. And the second, which is a kind of a meta problem coming from this, that this is actually not Ukraine's war, and this war is not just locally, you know, happening in Ukraine, and it's not just some, you know, border disputes or something. It has much more bigger implications. And even if people in some more geographically distant countries are not feeling this war, it doesn't mean this war is not against them as well. Thank you, Yavkan and Sally. Uh, uh, I just wanted to uh, continue on this point of neutrality, right? That uh, uh, it was suggested that uh, journalists should not try and stay neutral. I think we should indeed try and stick to the facts because the facts actually speak for themselves, right? If you present the audience with enough evidence, they can make up their own mind. I don't think that we should really try and force them to, you know, follow uh, one way or another because they are, uh, will give them some credit, I hope, intelligent enough and observant enough to, to really be able to see the facts. Uh, but an interesting uh, case of uh, misinformation that we actually haven't discussed was the Kahovka Dam, right? What happened there? How, how really this, this narrative that it was the Ukrainians who blew up the dam themselves really got a lot of traction online, right? And some people, so how were the facts manipulated or was there enough evidence you know, put uh, in reports and online by the Ukrainian side to actually, you know, nip this in the bud, like the, this Russian misinformation uh, thing. So I think, you know, facts, 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 and of course, uh, swift resolution of the conflict, that's another thing I wish for, just to avoid a war fatigue, but also um, we should keep in mind this young generation of people who are not really going to schools, who are living in constant distress and this will have far-reaching consequences for the ukrainian society because we have a you know whole generation really strongly affected by this so um again uh, facts and uh, a swift resolution of the conflict absolutely so i'd like to open it up for uh questions now um i see we've got a couple in the crowd let's go uh, to the lady in the tan jacket and purple shoes <laughs> I think you've got a mic coming over here. Hello, I want to ask you about Crimean informational crisis. As I understand, we can see the terrible experiment on alive people, which lasts not even like one year or two years after big war started, and even not 10 years when the like, conflict started. It continues for centuries, for example, as I understand. We have criminal speaker Konstantinov who tells terrible things about Jews, about Germans, about Nazis in Kiev. We have uh, Russian propaganda uh, bloggers, they call themselves bloggers who work in 
Telegram channels. Uh, they are looking for pro-Ukrainian people in Crimea. They force them to say sorry for their pro-Ukrainian position. They help uh, Russian army. Certainly, they work with uh, Russian forces. They work under Russian structures, and that is a great, terrible story, like in a book. Like when I read book about great. The, the island, you know, the book about the, it's something terrible happens, and what can be done? How can we solve this situation? How can we open Crimea history to the world, and how can we open the world to Crimea? Yeah, Crimea, a uh, huge, huge topic, and certainly one that, uh, when I mentioned before that we had trouble placing stories in 2016 and 2017, they were often about Crimea. Uh, nobody wanted to hear about Crimea then, and I think now we, we, we have even more of that problem. I'm really interested in some of the panelists' responses. Uh, whoever wants to take that one, go ahead. I can, uh, I can uh, start off with that, and I, suppose, and I guess you'll appreciate I can't talk about everything where our thinking is in this, in this space, um, but the... One thing I would say, um, you, you're, the back end of your question, how do we open up Crimea to the world? I think, um, and it, it uh, touches on something that Yevgeny mentioned around Maidan and the interfaith uh, dialogues that you saw taking place there. Um, we know in, in our conversations with, with countries around the world, sort of diplomatically, but also in forums like this and with, with civil society organizations, again, it comes to the point that I, I was talking about earlier, that a real ignorance from most of the world around this part of the world because of the, because of the modern history. Um, and actually what we've found is in, in a lot of cases, it's just people don't want to hear from, from a Brit or they don't want to hear from an American, or but, but actually if you've got Tatars speaking to other people around the, around the world about the situation that's taking place in Crimea. People are listening, and especially if you're looking with religious leaders um, from Crimea and talking uh, who have been exiled, and then they're speaking to other religious leaders uh, from the Muslim community. Like these, are, these human connections are really important, and I think they uh, they can be very effective in improving understanding. And, and as I mentioned earlier, I, I believe improving understanding is a real key blocker to. Uh, disinformation and, and, and it, it's you're opening up a more truthful dialogue that's on the terms of the person that's being spoken about so I think there is there is lots that can be done there is th there's a lot that's happening uh, to address the questions you've raised I think there's lots more that can be done but I think it's an ongoing process and it will change uh, as the kinetic situation changes in the south as well but I think first of all Ukraine need to get Crimea home back. That's number one. Number two, when I did Winter on Fire, it was interesting. Uh, America, for the first time, discovered that there is an uh, amazing country, Ukraine, and there is a country called Russia. Because Dora, who was basically at the beginning with her amazing foundation, uh, Razum, they remember how this movie literally opened eyes up became eye-opener and educated the people. I think we need to go to the filmmakers who are exist also in Crimea and also in Ukraine and start with, the, with their ability to tell the stories, tell the human stories from Crimea, historic stories. I try to, in all my movies, educate people. In the freedom, I literally took two and a half minutes backwards going into Kiev and Russia to educating people that it was Kiev who was way, 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 way before Moscow. Because you know what? Russia tends to rewrite the history. And that's the dangerous thing. And we need, again, filmmakers. I'm talking about filmmakers. Educate people. I was talking to one of the former ambassadors, uh, Ukrainian ambassadors, who was uh, in Toronto. Right now he's back in Ukraine who in 2021, Andriy Shevchenko, I think, uh, who was ambassador and who is also a journalist, who said, Yevgeny, take Winter on Fire, do a school program. Uh, take Freedom on, fi uh, Freedom on Fire, do a school program. We did, for my previous movie, actually, we, that I did with the Pope Francis, a school program, and it's successfully working, because you need to educate the younger generation. And I think that can be a good thing, education. Education with the ability of filmmakers to tell the story. 
But again, first starts with the Crimea coming home to Ukraine. Mm. And then I'm sure filmmakers will do their job. I heard already a lot of ideas that people want to do stories. And I think that comes together with education. I think um, also, you know, the Zelensky administration has really been trying to keep Crimea on the agenda through the office of the Crimea representative, and they've been doing some pretty impressive work. I, I was able to visit them uh, two weeks ago in Kiev. And the other thing that I'll mention, and it may seem a little bit cheeky, but I think they, they're really doing a good job. Um, the CSO St. Javelin, who puts out all this merchandise that supports Ukraine, they have a new like internal brand called Crimea Beach Party. And it's all sort of uh, like beachwear, towels, T-shirts, scarves with like beautiful castles and uh, seascapes from Crimea, and you know they're marketing toward a Western art audience, primarily American and Canadian. And I think there are a lot of people there who probably had absolutely no clue that Crimea is a beautiful part of land with mountains, with sea, with with all of these natural beauties. Um, and and they they keep saying, you know, when we retake Crimea, we're going to have this big party on the beach, which I think is a really, you know, interesting message and probably piques a lot of people's interest. So things like that can be useful as well. All right, we've got eight minutes left. Do we have another question? Yes, sir, right here in the front. Hi, just a couple of observations. Um, even speaking in the media is the problem, this, this balance. I don't, never expect Fox News to be balanced, but when CNN, Washington Post, New York Times also say, on the other hand, and then spew fake news, I think that's bad. Um, holding Fox, Fox lost its Dominion case for nearly a billion. The Facebook direction is they've got billions of people, not tens of millions but they're actually exempt from the law. They're protected by the government. Our own government in the US, our own government in the UK are full of conspiracy theorists. Brexit happened because of fake news. Trump happened because of fake news. We've actually about one day away from a close down in the US of government. And one of the points is funding Ukraine. That's how bad it is. So we aren't in control of our fake news in the UK, or the US. I'm not sure why we're giving advice to Ukraine as to what they should do. Well, I would agree with you there. Uh, and I certainly believe that we can learn a lot from Ukraine. And I'd also just say on a personal note, I am in the midst of a lawsuit against Fox News myself. Um, so <laughs> they're, they're part of the problem. And I've taken on some of the folks in Congress who are spreading these ridiculous rumors about Ukraine and about me and my buddy Yevhen as well. Um, so you've got a good friend in me. And I think all of us here uh, probably probably agree. I don't know if anybody wants to. Well, we won't, we won't let the diplomats. I mean, if you want to, go yeah, ahead, go on, Matt. Go on, yeah. <laughs> I would just I would expand on, on, on what you've said because I like I, I agree although not entirely as you'll be unsurprised but I think um, the all of the work I've ever done with with different governments in Ukraine and different state agencies it's always framed in that as a, as a UK government there's some things that we're pretty good at but that doesn't mean everything and the Ukrainian government there's a lot that they're very pretty good at so it's always as two friends let's sit down share experiences work out where you like what can I what can I learn from you guys to be better at my job what can I share that might help you do your jobs better I think um, you, what you've described to sort of arrogantly and pompously stroll in and go oh we can do this better than you I agree would just be stupid and I don't think that's appropriate and I'm, I'm pleased to say that that is not the nature of our relationship and I, I don't think I I don't think I see that in this context so I haven't yet great well we've only got a few minutes left I wonder if we have any closing thoughts from our panelists before we wrap up and uh, and give everyone a coffee break Perhaps uh, James looks maybe like he has something to say. <laughs> Sorry, James, for putting you on the spot. No worries at all. I mean, look, thank, this has been a great discussion. I, I mean, look, I, I don't want to repeat what I said before, but I, I, in a way, I feel like I have to, because I, I think for all of the things that we're talking about, uh, the key is how to maintain this. and. To the, to the question that just came up, you know, there's always going to be domestic churn in each of our home countries, including inside Ukraine, uh, that can affect in, in a positive or negative way. But at the end of the day, uh, that's what we can control is the dedicated focus on 
helping Ukraine win this war and, and win its future. Uh, and it's not about us, any of us telling Ukraine what to do. Believe, here on the ground, I totally see that every day. Uh, don't need to tell any Ukrainian what to do or how to do it. Uh, but there's a way to support. Uh, there's a way to work together. There's a way to be a partner uh, for Ukraine as it moves forward. Absolutely. Anybody else? Any last words? Well, uh, I want to thank the organizers of the World for Ukraine Summit for having us here today. All of you for your attention. All of you for your support of Ukraine. Slava Ukraini.